Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Maya Chitananda. I live in Northern California in the Santa Cruz Mountains at Karuna Buddhist Vihara. It's just me and Aya Santusika here, and we have a new Anna Garica that we're very excited about, and she's from Mexico. So we're working on her visa now. So today I wanted to talk about immigrating to the divine abodes because we've been doing a lot of immigration stuff <laughs> at the monastery. So it's kind of fun. Um, so hang on. Yeah, so I think maybe we'll just start with meditation. Is that, that's the usual, yeah, yeah, okay. So on that note, I think we'll do some Brahma Vihara meditation just for fun so the theme stays the same. Okay, so if everybody wants to just kind of relax a little bit and start grounding in the body. A few deep breaths. Maybe getting in touch with the body in an area that feels very comfortable. If you're used to paying attention to your belly or your nose, a good place to start. Letting your attention widen a bit more. And letting your attention focus on the heart area. Relaxing away any kind of discomfort you might feel. Just consciously allowing it to let go. And if it feels uncomfortable in any way, just allow your attention to be wherever it is comfortable. But if you're good with the attention resting around the heart, you can bring metta up in your mind, however that's the easiest for you. The usual recommendations of thinking of puppies or kittens or children or little duckies or something small that you, you care for and it's easy to wish well. Or you can use the phrases. Whatever really brings up the feeling of metta, the strongest for you. Sending out the wish for those beings to be happy, at ease, well mentally and physically and spiritually. Sometimes people find it difficult to start with themselves. So if you're going to use the phrases, whatever strongest, whatever makes the feeling of metta strongest, focus on that. Notice where you're feeling that metta the strongest in your body. And gradually spreading it wider and wider throughout your body.
until you can feel it infused in every cell. And breathe in the metta and breathing out, send it throughout your body. And if you notice any hindrances arising, that's okay. Just notice them and notice the metta stronger. Come back to the metta. And as you're noticing the metta throughout your body, realizing that right now, this is what you're abiding in. This is where your chitta is living. And as we abide in the metta, now we can also bring in karuna, compassion, which also has an element of metta within it. So we can bring to mind whoever um, makes the compassion arise the strongest for us right now. Maybe ourselves, maybe someone in our lives who <clears throat> we know is having a difficult time. Maybe the people of Ukraine or Sri Lanka where they're having trouble. Whichever object, whichever person or being comes up strongest for you. Bringing up the metta with the compassion. Feeling it in the heart center. And 
and breathing it in, breathing in the compassion and the wishes for these beings not to suffer, pushing them ease. Focusing on that well wish for them. Breathing that in. And breathing it out to the rest of your body. Focusing on the well-wishing for the beings that are suffering and not the suffering itself. Breathing in the caring concern. With metta, but with joy as well. Wishing for the best for all beings. With the same thread of metta, we bring up mudita, our sympathetic joy, gladness. Whatever brings that up for us the most Sometimes it's hearing children laugh or watching a family spend time together happily. Hearing a friend's good news. Having mudita for yourself that you're here doing something wholesome with your Sunday evening or morning, depending where you are. Spending time meditating with your Kalyanamita. Feeling the joy in your heart.
helping it grow with the breath and with continued kind thoughts, joyful thoughts. And again, noticing if there are any hindrances around distracting you from the sympathetic joy. And dealing with them accordingly. Then most of all, by hopefully replacing them with the stronger sense of mudita. And you are here abiding in the mudita. And anything else is unnecessary. Just being mindful of the joy. Feeling the joy throughout your body.
And then with the same sense of loving kindness and also joy, but a much subtler sense of joy. We come to pick our equanimity. And with the same method of finding what makes us feel equanimous. Maybe you know of someone who's doing something unwholesome and instead of being upset by it or um, disturbed or concerned, thinking of them with equanimity. And this is how karma is. They're making their own karma. If I can't help, if I can't help them change it, which in most cases we can't really, then just accepting it with the understanding that this is how it is. And bringing the metta to it, but also with a deep understanding. And bringing that sense of ease to the heart. Growing this ease in our hearts and spreading it wider and wider throughout our body. And spreading it wider and wider. sending it to as many beings as we can reach. really feeling the truth that there is suffering in this world and all worlds and there is impermanence and the relief that there is not a self no permanent abiding self
Now that we've had a little practice abiding in each of the Brahma Viharas, we get a choice to pick which one you'd like to spend more time in, which one you'd like to develop. Maybe which one would be most useful in your life at this time. Maybe loving kindness feels like the best choice or karuna, mudita, or upeka. And see which one feels right right now to abide in. And experiment with ways of making it grow, embodying it and spreading it throughout the four quarters and above and below, all around you, as far as you can. With ease, but enough effort to really have it benefit other beings. Maybe sending some metta to Ayachanda on her retreat. Maybe Karuna for people in very difficult situations. Mudita for your own practice. And equanimity for those who are not making the best choices, maybe. And as we come out of our meditation, we can still continue to abide in whichever divine abiding we've chosen. We can carry it through the rest of our day with us.
and continue to send it out to all beings. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling pretty gooey. <laughs> yeah, gooey. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was, I was, I was saying at the beginning, we've been having a lot of um, stuff going on this week with visa applications for our Anagarka, who's um, from Mexico. And I thought it'd be a fun theme to like try immigrating to the divine abodes. And I don't know, that felt a lot easier to me than the visa stuff. So <laughs> I hope it was easy for you too. <laughs> yeah, no paperwork involved. It's good. <laughs> no lawyers. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about the Brahma Viharas before, but I'll just do a quick little review of the metta, um, loving kindness, karuna, is often translated as compassion, but it's kind of a, it's maybe not the best translation and I still haven't run into one that I like better. So I just keep using it, but we'll talk about that more later. And um, mudita, sympathetic joy or gladness and upeka, which is equanimity, or I kind of like to call it acceptance 2.0. Um, more about that later. <laughs> so we have, yeah. Um, you might have noticed throughout the meditation, I, I find metta is pretty strong throughout all of the Brahma Viharas. It's like metta plus another element in the other three. And yeah, like abiding in them kind of means like, um, to me, you can do it in different ways, but I've heard that the arahants are always abiding in one of the four at any given time, whichever one seems the most appropriate for their situation. So I like to think of it like that, like abiding means really um, that's where your heart lives. Your heart lives in the metta or the karuna, the mudita or the upeka at any given time. And that's how I like to try to practice it. Like you, um, we practice while we're meditating and that kind of builds up the, the muscle for it. You build up the practice for it and then trying to practice carrying it throughout the day. And eventually it kind of becomes more natural and it comes up by itself spontaneously arises depending on the situation. So I, I think it's good to try to do it on the cushion and then consciously come up with which one am I, um, which one is the best to apply right now for this situation throughout your day and yeah <laughs> I guess maybe I'll, I'll go more into the, the list of, of meta things so um like in the meditation different people will find different things bring it up strongest for them and it really is sort of what's going to be the most sort of altruistic and also the most um unattached it's not like a personal kind of love so that's kind of an important element people get a little bit um, confused when they bring it up for loved ones sometimes because it feels so attached even though they're trying not to so i when i when i practice it i sometimes try to do it with people who i'm not so close to perhaps to begin with <laughs> i kind of mix up the order that you generally hear um just because it works better for me <laughs> Yeah, and it, it seems to be, because it runs through all of the other ones, it seems to be like the most frequent one that arises for me, and different people have different propensities, so if you're kind of an anger type, it's a good one to like try to grow strongly to counteract when, when occasions arise that your anger is being stirred up and you need more of the loving kindness around. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think Metta has been spoken about a lot, so maybe I'll move on to the Karuna. I think people get confused a lot 
in, in talking to different friends who've been around recently, it's like, it's not really suffering with uh, beings who are suffering. This is supposed to be a divine abiding. It's supposed to feel really good. It's, it's a sublime feeling. And compassion is a weird translation in a way, because I think it's Latin for like to suffer with, and this is definitely not suffering with it's, it's, it's a joyful thing um, when you think about the wish for them not to suffer. So you, you are focusing on that joyful wish, the good thing, the positive feeling that comes up with compassion. It's not um, the, the sticky, depressive, tight, clenched down kind of feeling that one might have if they're thinking about the suffering of their people or our own suffering. <laughs> It works the same way. It's um, it's not just the, the the mere enemy of pity, like pitying someone in a bad situation. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot about Anukampa, so <laughs> I maybe you don't need to say much about that. It's also sometimes translated, usually translated as compassion, but I think of it more as like empathy, and it doesn't have the same kind of of uh, wish for the reduction of suffering or the, the removal of suffering for other beings. It has more of that element of like trembling with a little bit more like to suffer with kind of compassion, not quite, but it has the, um, you've probably heard this before too, but like in the ordination ceremony, when you become a monastic, they use the word anukampa. So out of compassion for me, please ordain me because you know the feeling of wanting so badly to ordain. So it's, it's that kind of feeling, the, the empathy and the, it is deep compassion for beings. So anyway, different, <laughs> more like the trembling is there and Karuna it's, it's pure joy. And then Mudita is kind of my favorite one that I, I, have more naturally than the others um it like i i laugh if i hear other people laughing and i have no idea what they're laughing at it just makes me really happy to hear them laugh <laughs> so like I, i'd be walking by somebody having a conversation and they'll, they'll be laughing and it'll just make me really happy <laughs> it'll just make me smile too even though i don't have any idea what's going on or even if i don't understand a joke or what what's so funny with if i do hear it <laughs> i'm still happy that they're happy um yeah, and, and kind of like I was saying, I think people do have different propensities. So some might come naturally. A lot of people have compassion arise a lot. And I think I've noticed that they can get more depressed that way. So working with that, if you are a very compassionate person, letting it be the true Karuna compassion where you aren't suffering with them and you're focused on wanting to help and the joy of that well wish. And of course, you know, um, where you're weak, you want to practice more. So if, if you're really good at the compassion or you're really good at the metta, but you're not so good with the equanimity, then maybe spending time working with that would be good. Um, I know that's probably a harder one for me <laughs> sometimes. So we all have our areas. It's just like anything else in the practice. What we do more, we get better at. So, yeah. And then um, Upeka is interesting in general. I think it's different because it doesn't really have the same kind of wish in it that the other three has. The other three have. There's like, Metta, you're wishing someone well. May you be happy and well. May you be peaceful. May you attain nibbana. It's nice things. Karuna too, may you not suffer anymore. May your suffering be relieved. Mudita is kind of like, may your good fortune continue. There's this nice wish to those three. But Upeka is kind of like that acceptance with deep understanding of how karma works. And it's the wisdom factor of the Brahma Viharas. So it's like, yep, that's that's not good. But there's nothing we can really do. This is just the nature of reality kind of feeling. And it might sound a little cold, but it isn't because the meta is definitely still running through it. And you still have 
a kindness there. It's not a, a cold, like, or, or painful. It's not a cold or painful sort of acceptance of the situation. It's a insightful, wise understanding. So it's also sublime. It's, it's a divine feeling. It's not a dismissive or um, un, un, like heartless, uncaring kind of feeling. I was trying to explain it to my sister, who's a, a therapist, and she's not Buddhist, but she she immediately wants to label it acceptance, and it's like acceptance plus. <laughs> the the wisdom element is, I think, the most important part about this, at least in my mind, it is. So, yeah, um, yeah, there's a a sense of ease and almost relief and contentment that comes along with that. And that subtle sense of joy that like, yep, this is how it is. <laughs> yeah. So I think I don't really have that much more to say. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions until um, I think we've got about 45 minutes left or so. Yeah. So yeah. I hope you have questions because <laughs> I'm not a big talker. <laughs> I can always see the same faces each week, so you already know this, but to ask a question, you can put your, your raise hand button at the bottom of the Zoom page to have like that, exactly, thank you. <laughs> or you could just wave at the screen and we'll try and find you. I'll ask Rob to unmute. Thanks. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how often you practice these Brahma Viharas um, and how often, how, when you first started doing it, mm -hmm. how long it took you to actually get some consistency in bringing it, in, bringing it into your everyday life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I started pretty much when I started Buddhist practice. So I don't know. 15 plus years now and I do it it varied it has varied a lot over time sometimes I need to practice it more than others so these days at least a few times a week um to really get the juices flowing I I find it situational I think when something's been up um in my life then I have, I have the need for it more. So I would practice it more and it would be stronger at those times. So um, when my mom got sick, maybe oh, 10 years ago now, eight, eight or 10 years ago, she got pretty ill. And that was a time for me to be practicing a lot of equanimity and a lot of compassion. And it did really help grow those by doing the formal practices and, and using my mom for the object for me. Um, and yeah, it, it varies a lot. I think it's just like anything else in practice in the long run, it does, it does depend on the situation. So like the other day, I've been doing some practice with the Brahma Viharas, different ones, nothing specific, but I was noticing the creek back behind our place looking very, very dry for this time of year. It's pretty low droughty kind of year and hearing the birds and kind of thinking, well, <laughs> this is how it is. This is the effects of climate change and the world we live in now. And my compassion for the birds arising, like worried that they wouldn't have enough water um, turned into equanimity and, and more of a true compassion, like wishing them well, hoping that will be okay and find something, some other water source somewhere. <laughs> so it just, yeah, it depends. Um, and the more, the more I do it formally, again, the more it comes up by itself throughout the day. So yeah. <laughs> I'll ask Shell to unmute. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. 
Cool. Um, thank you so much for the meditation and um, thank you just for sharing just now um, the answers to that. Uh, my questions kind of lie around particularly equanimity um, and medita as well, but um, more specifically, how uh, kind of any tips um, and examples of how we can express more medita, particularly to those that we might have some troubles with, um, either that be people that we might not agree with their way of life or what they're doing or people that might have caused us suffering. Um, and yeah, and how we kind of bring more equanimity or how you've brought more equanimity in your life. And mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. I think in those cases, what I generally do is try to look at um, the person more not not focusing on the unwholesome qualities or the bad qualities, but like as a whole person and focusing on the good qualities that they might have. Like if, if mudita is appropriate, if something good has happened to someone who you don't think very well of, who you see a lot of bad qualities in, and it's like, oh, they must have some good qualities for this good thing to have arisen for them. So trying to pay more attention to the wholesome side of people um, and not look at the unwholesome side because really it's not benefiting. It's not benefiting you to look at the unwholesome things because that's their karma, you know, like whether or not you do anything or whether or not they do anything, there will be results of their actions. And of course they can mitigate it if they improve, but it, it's still, there will be consequences for unwholesome actions. So just kind of remembering that and it doesn't help them for you to think poorly of them. It doesn't help you to think poorly of them. So just, yeah, focusing on the good is um, a good way to bring more peace to yourself <laughs> and, and the situation, the other person when you're relating to them too. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will ask um, Melanie to unmute. Um, thank you. That was very interesting, venerable. And um, what I found very interesting was your explanation about compassion, because uh, sometimes when I think about Karuna, um, I used to, well, my tendency was to think about the suffering of the people and I would feel very, not kind of distressed, but stressed inside and suffering also. And um, so I guess it's not the point to be suffering at the same time. So I, I was very um, happy to hear your explanation about um, it's not that you suffer at the same time, but you wish them to be free from suffering. And it's the, if I understand well, if the thought of them being better and free from suffering, which, which is, uh, which we should rejoice about. So, and I think I think it's going to help me because sometimes when I'm I'm very tired and I don't feel this way and I have a tendency to not to feel good about people when I think about people suffering from whatever sickness or war. So that was very helpful. Um, and um, my question, I have also a question is, um, when it's hard for me to, to think about compassion, is it not better not to visualize somebody, uh, I mean, a person you know, but maybe like suffering more general kind of suffering? I think I understand the question, but I might not, so you might have to clarify. <laughs> but. Um, so you're thinking like bigger picture kind of suffering and not looking at the individual, like individual suffering. Is that 
Yes, yes. Or maybe, maybe if, if I don't feel like it, maybe use something else like Meta or Mudita. Yeah, yeah. I, I think sometimes it's hard for me to to practice compassion because I I suffer at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think my advice would be to try to find something where you're not suffering at the same time. And maybe like you're saying, just general suffering, not bringing specifics to mind might be good. Um, but mm, if you can find an object, say, I don't know, there's like a, like a wounded bird or something. And there's not, it's not so personal to you. Like you just see an animal that's like a wild animal that's hurt. It's not so personal and maybe it's not even so bad. Like maybe it's a minor injury and see if something um, like that, that isn't so much suffering can bring up real Karuna where you're not suffering from it. And you can be like, oh, may it get better. May, may it not suffer anymore. Um, with the right kind of feeling, not the suffering with it kind of feeling. Maybe try to start small like that because I think it's, it might be a little too nebulous to not have something more um, visual or more, I don't know, concrete um, than just general suffering. So you could try that. Um, and maybe you don't work with it for a while, like you're saying, maybe you do try meta more, build up that more and see how it affects your karuna practice can try different things but I think I would try to find something um, some object that brings up compassion without you suffering over it just to get the right feeling going and then have that grow later as you work with it thank you that's very helpful thank you Raya (laughs) thanks for the question I will ask Minori to unmute very much um, venerable about uh, explanation about equanimity mm-hmm. uh, and my question is um, I'm, I'm good in practicing the other areas but I never thought of practicing the equanimity how would one go about um, practicing the equanimity or is it is it something like a, you know insight like a logical thing that you you know, talk to yourself about, or is it something that you can sit on the cushion and practice? Yeah, I think you can sit on the cushion and practice. Um, I think I've heard it described mostly this way, and I I feel like it's probably true. It comes up the strongest for me when somebody's doing something unwholesome and I'm um, uncomfortable with it. Like I'm kind of worried about it, or I feel uneasy about it and then looking at it in the way of like yeah there's karma there (laughs) they're creating some karma and there's nothing I can really do and um that's okay this is just how samsara works you know like there is this suffering yeah and there's nothing we can do about it so it it feels um kind of like a relief in a way there's a relief feeling around it so bringing that up like if if you look at I don't know um we have somebody working at the monastery here occasionally doing things and his life is not going in a good direction he's not doing some he's he started drinking alcohol again and and smoking cigarettes and things and having mm, not the most wholesome feeling people around maybe Um, around him in his life now and that's a change and we we can try talking to him about it but ultimately it's just like yeah there's going to be consequences for this his life is not going to get better it's going to get worse the way it's going now and when you can't really do anything about it and you see this clearly with with enough insight around it then the feeling is like this, this contentment or this ease around it, uh, this relief around it. So bringing up that feeling, like you can use examples like this in your meditation 
and really focusing on you do have the loving kindness for them. You do have the well wish for them to get better and all the other things, but you also really have the um, intellectual understanding of it and, and kind of contemplating that will help it be become more of an insight. So you really know it deeply and you kind of feel it in your body. So feeling that feeling of equanimity in your body during meditation and focusing on it and really like embodying it, um, letting it fill your being and sort of spreading it out, you know, <laughs> like metta, <laughs> like the other Brahma Vihara meditations in the suttas, they say, you know, um, abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with equanimity or any of the other Brahma Viharas. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all is to myself. So, yep, that helps. <laughs> that kind of, um, with all of these, you really try try to find ways to bring the feeling up strongly and the right kind of feeling, as we're describing, like this, this sense of acceptance with wisdom and like a peacefulness. And it's, a, it's almost a very subtle joy, I find. And I think that makes sense for something that's a sublime abiding, <laughs> like a divine abiding. It should feel really good. It should feel like um, somewhere you want to abide, something um, useful and a useful way to interact with other people, like other beings in the world. So, yeah. <laughs> Hope that answered something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess contemplating, contemplating impermanence in general also um, brings up a lot of equanimity for me. So in your other kinds of meditation, when you're just doing vipassana or, you know, your daily practice kind of stuff, bringing up impermanence is also strengthening of the equanimity, I think. I would ask Rob to unmute. Um, do you experience equanimity as an emotion, a feeling? Because it's often talked about more as just like um, acceptance or wisdom or intellectually. Yeah, I think I do. I think any of the Brahma Viharas, I do feel there is an emotional component to it. You really feel it in the body. Um, it's definitely a heart-centered kind of feeling for me, not not just thinking about things, but the thinking about it is what gets it to sink in deeper and actually feel. <laughs> so, yeah, I do. Do you? Yeah, I do, yeah. Um, but I don't often hear it talked about in that way, that's all. Uh -huh. um, so it's just kind of good to hear you say that in a way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think as a like one of the aggregates, like feeling. Um, sometimes people want to say it's it's just pleasant, painful, or neutral, but it's a funny mix of like emotional too. There's the emotional bit as well as the physical, and I think this is in that realm, <laughs> same kind of area of like divine abiding is definitely a feeling, and it's it has the physical component and the emotional component for me as well. If I may, I'd like to follow up on this because if it's a feeling, a, a felt sense in the body, mm -hmm. is it, in your opinion, essential that the Brahma Viharas have an object externally. So we often think of directing it meta towards another being or beings. 
but could it be just the felt sense of, for example, loving kindness or the felt sense of compassion? Yeah, definitely. I think that's the best way to practice it, actually. I think for, for me, it's um, coming up with an object is just a way to tap into that feeling and make it grow stronger. I think for all of these, the essential bit is that the feeling, making that feeling grow and really that's, that's how you abide in it. It's like the feeling is very strong and that is where your heart is. That's what you're acting out of. That's what you're thinking. That's the lens you're seeing things through. It's, um, yeah, the most important part. <laughs> Thanks for asking. It's <laughs> a good point. Yeah. I will ask for Veronica to unmute. Hi. Thank you for the talk and the meditation. Um, I have just a comment, not a question particularly, but I have to say that I really wrestled with Upeka for many years, many years. Um, but I have found it a whole heap. It's one that I seem to find much easier as I've gone along the path. You know, I kind of parked it for a while and tried to deal with the other ones. I'm not saying I'm any good at any of them particularly, but I really couldn't get in touch with Upeka at all. But after years and years and years, maybe because you keep seeing situations repeat around you. And so you realise that really the only way is to observe with acceptance to help obviously if it's a situation which requires help but the only way is to develop upeka and i've also heard adam brown translate upeka as contentment which i found that helpful mm -hmm. but yeah. just a comment yes thank you for sharing that's great <laughs> I agree. I think like the more we see that this is just how samsara is, this is the way the world works, um, the more content we can be, the more at ease with situations. And yeah, the I, I like what you said about, you know, the compassionate action is important, but if you have equanimity while you're doing it, it's even better. <laughs> you try both, you know, Brahma Vihara combo. <laughs> it's better. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I'll ask Shell to unmute. Hi, sorry. Um, I should have said this earlier. First of all, I am um, happy. Waysack and happy Waysack to everyone in the community. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of Waysacked out of um, been, I'm at Gaia House uh, in Devon. So we had some really beautiful celebrations and I was able to take the uh, five precepts today, which was exciting. Um, but I just really wanted to ask you how you are celebrating it at Karuna. Um, and if you have any traditions yourself and as a monastic, what it means to you. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, we are. So I think tomorrow is the day we're kind of celebrating, which is funny. It's Monday, but <laughs> we're just, you know, not that. Um, oddly enough, we're not very holiday-ish. We kind of, um, some years we have a Vesak celebration, some years we don't. And if it's in person, we do the like bathing the baby Buddha ceremony and we have a little um, shrine we walk around when we do it and it's kind of fun um, but I think in recent years with the pandemic we haven't really done much of anything <laughs> so we just start I don't know yeah very holiday-ish and it's it's fun when we are and I think people really enjoy it and we do too um, what's nicer than celebrating the Buddha <laughs> 
you know, it's like he's the whole whole reason we have anything to practice um, in this system that's so complete, and then that can get us as far along the path as we possibly can get. <laughs> I don't think I could ever come up with this myself. I don't think I would ever be a Buddha. So there's a lot of um, mudita and gratitude that comes up for me. And yeah, I think most people, at least the people that we have coming to our community are not, they're definitely not ethnic Buddhists. So it's not as much in their culture, I guess you would say. Um, so we don't generally have that many big, big ceremonies or anything for this i don't know <laughs> but it's happy to it's happy to hear that other places are <laughs> yeah we have local temples that do a big international kind of thing they had mm, not this weekend i think the weekend previous weekend where they have like i think a vietnamese temple a sri lankan temple and a tibetan temple and they all get together and have a little parade um through, uh, I think it's just one neighborhood in San Jose that's oh, like an hour from here or so. So they do the, the fun things and we're kind of the boring monastery. <laughs> we're out here hiding in the forest. <laughs> yeah. But ritual is good. Way to celebrate it in the forest. <laughs> Sorry? What a beautiful way to celebrate it in the forest. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow we're going to have a, a long, I think, um, practice session, kind of honoring it in the morning. So that'll be our one thing. <laughs> what do they do? Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> what does what does Anukampa do for it usually when Venerable Chand is there? Um, when Venerable Chand is here, there's very often a talk with Ajahn Brahm. So we spend the day together with Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda, and we do some meditation and some talks and question and answers. Uh -huh. and it usually goes on from, for most of the day. Oh, wow. That's nice. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. I think I would like that more than ritual stuff. I'm, I'm not very... Um, into formalities <laughs> so that sounds like a much more interesting thing for me too maybe we'll do it next year <laughs> yeah. does anybody have favorite Bra brahma viharas that they like to practice or interesting ways of practicing them that they want to share I'll go to Rob. Yeah, just going back to the equanimity one. Um, to me, it's more like a feeling of perspective and balance. And what I do is um, I look back over my life, particularly when I was a lot younger and the things that I was doing. And it starts to bring about a sense of perspective on, on my whole life almost like the opposite of getting uh, bogged down into one problem, like today's problem becomes a drama. Um, but when I, when I kind of see my whole life as, as more of a bigger overview, it, it brings out that um, it, it is, it's an, it's an emotion. So, but it's kind of like an emotion that's related to um, perspective of things, I suppose. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I think that works with the other Brahma Viharas too, in a way. And it's like big picture, take a step back and, and things do look like, oh, that's a good situation for Metta. <laughs> You're not stuck. It's like a, it's an opening kind of feeling with all of the Brahma Viharas. You kind of open up to more, to all beings really. Not be so hyper-focused on our own problems. <laughs> I like the idea of spreading it too. Um, do y'all do y'all know the conk blower sutta? I think it's the Upanisa sutta. You heard of that one? 
not so much. Anyway, <laughs> um, I can't, oh, shoot. I can't remember what the beginning of it is like, which is a shame. But the, the ending is talking about the Brahma Viharas and how you kind of abide in them and you spread it like a, in the four directions and above and below, like a conch, a conch blower would blow in each direction and you could easily hear it everywhere. It's the same kind of thing. You're easily, you spread the Brahma Viharas really far and people can feel it. <laughs> it helps. Maybe at the end we should send... We should send some Mudita to Aya Chanda, <laughs> Venerable Chanda. Hmm. What do you think, Metta or Mudita? Who, who votes for Metta? Okay, who wants Mudita? Oh, oh, that was Metta. Okay, okay, now Mudita. Who wants Mudita? Oh, <laughs> maybe we do both. Both, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Hmm, I think we have more time, though. I have another, how much time do we have? Another half hour plus, looks like. I think approximately 10 minutes. Oh, really? Hmm. I'm all over the place with the time. So I, I might as well tell them my embarrassing story. I, I marked on our calendar that um, the time was, I guess, 10.30 here, 10.30 a.m. here. But I put that before daylight savings time happened over in the UK. <laughs> So I got on like an hour early. I'm like, Derek, where is everybody? <laughs> yeah, so my timing is, <laughs> don't know what time it is. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, maybe we do the next like 10 minutes or so, five, 10 minutes of more practice. We can send Ayachanda things and see what she feels. Maybe she'll say, I had this one day where there was so much meta and mudita. And we'll know, we'll know, we'll know why. <laughs> okay. Mm. Okay. okay, I still like to do the kind of getting grounded again thing. So I'm going to take another couple deep breaths. Sorry, Ladybug. We can bring up the feeling of meta again. In whatever way that feels the easiest for us. And with the feeling growing strong. I'm thinking of Aya Chanda. And Venerable Chanda, I think she likes better. <laughs> sort of filling our hearts with metta and dropping her in. Sometimes I like to think of it as like egg meditation. We drop Aya Chanda into the center of it like a like an egg yolk, and we're surrounding her with egg white. <laughs> Our little egg. Completely bathing and kind of soaking.
wrapping her in metta. Drawing the feeling of metta for her with a lot of appreciation for her guidance and teachings and all of the metta that she has for us as well. And sending it out to her. May she be happy. May she be well. May she be benefiting from the time off that she has right now to practice and Go deeper in Dhamma. And having the metta kind of develop into mudita, a lot of joy for her. Having time with her Kalyana Mita and her teacher who's very important to her. A lot of gladness thinking of her meditating out in the woods in Australia, out in the bush someplace in a kuti. Free from all her duties and welcome to just spend time in deep meditation. Wishing her the same sense of freedom that we can feel when we're practicing metta and mudita. And we just focus on the metta and mudita for her. The hindrances drop away. And there's nothing but pure metta and joy. And sending her one last blast of metta and mudita. And sending her energy and patience and endurance. And sharing all of our practice with her. I'm wishing her all the best right now during this very precious and valuable time.
as we spread it to, uh, to Venerable Chanda, we can let that spread even further to all beings. Because all beings want to be happy and not suffer. And may we all achieve the same freedom from all suffering. And may we all attain Nibbana as soon as possible. And reach that highest happiness. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aya Chitnanda, for being there and for that beautiful meditation where even if Venerable Chanda doesn't directly feel it, I definitely think that as a community, we're all feeling it together. And I think that's something quite special. So thank you for leading that. Sure. Happy to. And thank you for also all your generosity in teaching us and answering our questions. Sure. <laughs> Happy to. <laughs> I'm not very talkative, but thank you for the good questions. It's, um, there's something that came to my mind throughout this week, and I would like to try and share it, but I don't know if I'll be able to express myself properly. And that is that quite often at the end of these sessions, I say a few words and I try to offer the opportunity to, to donate to the Yannou Camp Project. And I always say it like this, please can we think about how we can donate to the Yannou Camp Project? And it came to my mind during the week that I'm asking the wrong question. I should be realizing that it's our project. It's a project of all of us being able to come together and share in the Dharma and learn from, especially our bhikkhunis teachers, but also from each other as we ask the questions. So if anybody would like to donate to our project, <laughs> then you may do so by looking at anucamperproject.org forward slash donate. This gives all the instructions. Also, I'd like to just mention, of course, Aya Chitananda's monastery. I would like to just say that if you'd like to find out more about this project and this monastery in California, then you can do so via Karuna bv.org and one other thing about our project is that there's this opportunity a wonderful opportunity in november to get together and see each other in person and there's lots of events where ajahn brahm and venerable chanda will be teaching together and if you'd like to find out more about this and to find out how you can come to these events and book tickets then you can look at our website as well which is anucamperproject.org forward slash events and this gives information about when and where the different talks will be held. So thank you very much and see you again soon. <laughs>